every meal. Soda pop comes in two flavors, lemon and warm. That too is standard throughout Russia. The heavy white bread is very delicious, but every meal for three weeks, it begins to lose something. So the flat unleavened bread of Bukhara was a welcome change. The main dish was a sort of kitchen surprise. Not bad, but not really good either. Oh yes, I must mention the abacus. Not once in all our travels did we see an adding machine. The abacus is on every counter. The Russians are so proficient with this ancient device that I swear they could total up a column faster than our machines. Bukhara is probably the most primitive city of its size in the entire Soviet Union. It has none of the new technology Russian rule has brought to other cities and states. Most of Bukhara's citizens still dress, eat, and live much as they did when Genghis Khan ravaged the city. For a long period in medieval times, it was the center of Islamic culture. At one time, Bukhara had over 100 madrasas or schools for training Muslim priests. Here are the remaining ruins of a great wall that encircled the oasis of Bukhara for a total circumference of 200 miles. In the beginning, the wall was built for defense against marauding bands of thieves. It was soon discovered that the wall had a secondary value of no little importance. It prevented the perpetually shifting sands from periodically covering the oasis. There were 11 gates in the wall. Over each gate, a fort such as this controlled the traffic passing through. Each fort stabled fast horses for communication with the emir's palace. A small outhouse still serves as home for an Uzbek family. Bukhara is an oasis because it does have water. Along the banks of this irrigation ditch, green grass grows, and trees make shade from the burning sun. Blessings made possible by water and appreciated by man and beast. This is the tomb of the Samanids. Saman, the emir of Bukhara early in the ninth century, was the founder of the, the Samanid dynasty. This mausoleum was erected for him. His bones, along with the remains of succeeding princes and kings, are entombed here. This monument is famous among ar architects throughout the world for its beauty of line and balance, its engineering, but most of all for its most exquisite use of bricks and stone. Let your mind contemplate for a moment the micrometer exactness with which these early masons placed each piece to create this masterpiece. In the center of this history-rich city is the citadel. It was a formidable fort, and at the same time, the palace of the emir. Originally built in the third century before Christ, it has been conquered and destroyed by invaders many times, beginning with Alexander the Great in 329 BC. After each invasion, the damage was soon repaired. So in spite of its violent history, the citadel remains, and today it is a museum. Exhibits in the various rooms emphasize the utterly preposterous extravagance of the former owners. Comparatively speaking, it was just a few short years ago that this bastion was stormed and conquered last. It was in 1920 that communist forces successfully assaulted this fort and drove the emir from this throne. Here is more of the stalactite motif. The emir escaped with his life and fled to Kabul in Afghanistan, where he was reputed to be a tea merchant. This entranceway leads to the summer palace of Bukhara's last emir. He completed it only months before he fled the Kami's revolution. Bukhara was founded more than 2,500 years ago, and since that time, was under the rule of countless kings or emirs. There have been good, bad, and indifferent, the gentle, the just, and the cruel. But Bukhara's last, the emir Abdul Ahad, was the cruelest, 
most despotic man who ever sat upon the throne of the Emirate of Bukhara. He was the kind of man who took pleasure in throwing his fellow man into a pit infested with bugs whose bites tortured but did not kill. This was just one of his amusements. Beheading with a scimitar was considered fine sport and he had many more too gruesome to mention. He maintained a harem of more than 100 wives. Some say the number was closer to 400. Just imagine kissing 400 women goodbye every morning before hying off for the bug pit. With 400 of the kingdom's prettiest gals, this dope thought it was fun to watch bugs. The palace grounds now serve as a public park. It features a large poster of a child-loving, benevolent Lenin, which he was anything but. We are spending our last day in Bukhara on a walking tour of the nearby medieval buildings in the heart of the city. The doorway we just saw leads to the bazaar. This is the ancient marketplace of Bukhara. The domes are interconnected to form one large building. Many towers and steeples are crowned with storks' nests, but I never did see a stork. Here is the infamous Tower of Death, so-called because many hapless wrongdoers were forced to leap to their doom from the balcony. Known as the Great Minaret of Bukhara, it is 135 feet high. It was built by the Muslims in 1127. Although built for the purpose of calling the faithful to prayer, it was often used to send smoke signals to lost caravans. This evening, we catch a plane for a night flight to Moscow and home. This is our last opportunity to talk with the man on the street. Like everywhere else in Russia, the people are sincere in their friendship. The elusive blessings of world peace could come to this earth if the heads of these two great nations would find friendship and understanding. In the past three weeks, we have traveled 10,000 miles inside the great and vast land known as a Union of Socialist States of Russia. We were impressed with the progress made under communism as opposed to life under the czars. There are places and products as fine as anything we have. Although on the average, they trail us by 30 years and they can never catch us. Our one great overwhelming advantage is the fact that we have God.